post professorship lecture and uh, also a general seminar. And I'm really pleased to see lots of students and faculty. And uh, I think uh, this is the earliest we've ever started one of these seminars in history. <laughs> Just to say that we, we celebrated uh, last week the 80th anniversary of social research, the journal. And Ira Katz Nelson actually put together a compilation of the greatest hits from 80 years of social research. And uh, you should pick this up. Um, if you're looking for a copy, we have, we have Hi Arian, I'm just uh, advertising the 80th anniversary issue. And social research, of course, emerged right at the same time as the general seminar did at the uh, University in Exile. And uh, they were both kind of ways of uh, being interdisciplinary and being public about the ideas that were emanating from the faculty here. And uh, the more we open up the general seminar, the more it will continue to play that traditional role. Today, uh, you know, I think social research, quite frankly, is, is morphing in some ways. Arian, don't, don't get upset. But I think social research is morphing itself into something that will have uh, contemporary relevance in terms of online status. And she's been working with Jeff Goldfarb and others at Public Seminar to put the content of social research online as well. And so Public Seminar is here recording this event today, and, and you'll be able to share that. I assume that the, the link to that uh, full video with uh, all your closest friends. Um, the Hoist Professorship is the one general seminar at which we have a nice reception following. So please stay around and join us uh, when we're done with the question and answer discussion section. Join us for the reception to celebrate really what's been a terrific year of a Hoist professorship. And in the tradition of the general seminar, um, I've asked, I'm going to introduce the introducer, and Larry Hirschfeld, who's the chair of Department of Anthropology, who is also professor of anthropology and psychology here, will do the introductions. Larry's work, for those who don't know, and he needs very little introduction, centers on psychological mechanisms supporting cultural systems of classification, including those that shape race and ethnicity in children. He has published extensively on that. Larry also currently has uh, a couple of externally funded, at least one and maybe two, externally funded research projects. And my hope is that when his chairmanship ends in the Department of Anthropology, that he will sit here and give a general seminar on some of his current research. So I'm going to introduce Larry Hirschfeld to introduce the Hoist Professor. Uh, that, that is, there's a difficult choice between doing a general seminar and continuing to share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to, uh, to introduce our colleague in anthropology, uh, Robin Berge, and the, his Hoist lecture entitled Anthropology, Critique, and Hope. Um, I'm, I'm impressed by many. I've been, I have been over this academic year impressed by a number of things that uh, uh, probably other people here know about the extraordinary impact he's had on, on our students and on our intellectual um, community. But I was, I was particularly um, uh, struck by his willingness to acknowledge self limitations at the uh, Martin Luther University in Halle. Halle Wittenberg, Germany, where he's a professor of anthropology and philosophy. He established a research group, this is according to his w website there, which is called The Lost Group. I uh, wasn't sure whether that referred to some kind of epistemic bewilderment or a group that uh, was interested in Peter Pan in some, in some way, but I, I, I liked the, uh, I, I liked it. Uh, I later discovered, however, that LOST refers to law, organization, science, and technology, <laughs> uh, which was a great disappointment, but, uh, to me at least. Uh, Dr. <coughs> Professor Roddenberg works in the space between anthropology, philosophy, and particularly science and technology studies. Uh, reflecting this interest, his uh, 2009 book, Far-Fetched Facts, which is could just be a general text on anthropology, I suppose, 
uh, from uh, MIT Press tells a fictionalized story, a sort of uh, ethnography, actually, of a large waterworks project viewed from the perspective of two bemused anthropologists observing the local, national, and international stakeholders trying to legitimize the use of technologies of representation. The uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Zeitung uh, called the, uh, the uh, book an epistemological thriller of developmental aid. Um, his current work is inspired by uh, uh, pragmatist social theory and focuses on the emergence of material semantic orderings and their institutionalization within and through contingent ordering practices. I know he's, he's, he's also working on issues having to do with design that we talked about the other, the other night. He has a book, I think is still forthcoming, of the world of indicators, the making of government knowledge through quantification. It's an area that you've been teaching, I'm sure I know, with a great deal of, uh, of uh, interest in the students. Another favorite of mine is a 2000 article he wrote called Sitting in a Bar, which I'm going to let him, uh, if, he, if, if he chooses, tell us exactly what kind of ethnographic experience that was, um, that we might not already know from our own experience. But um, I, I see your do see your daughter here without my glasses, right? Um, the, and I don't know if your wife is here or not. She did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, our, our, our daughter came to only one talk that I know of that either Anne or I have ever given, and she threw up. Um, <laughs> but um, I think it was something that Anne fed her. In any case, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have nothing as exciting as that from on the other side of the podium today. And I'm pleased to uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And also, thank you very much for having me here as the so-called voice professor. In, in the months I'm here since last August, I must admit I came to love this place for a great number of things, but uh, the only one I want to mention now is that perhaps because the new school as a university is uh, a bit marginal and constantly needs to reinvent itself, itself and is constructed around the notion of being critical and political, the normal way of doing science survives here, I believe, better than in other more saturated places, namely that uh, it is about disagreeing. So the only agreement is that we all disagree. And uh, I, I come to love particularly this, this aspect of it, uh, because I think it, it, it marks a difference to other places who try to be cutting edge and where disagreement seems to be a, a good reason to be sidetracked. This is not the case here. So I hope to express a few ideas today which provoke disagreement. That's the, the purpose of giving a, a, a talk. Um, I will structure my talk in, in three parts, and I will work with paper only, living up to the stereotype that uh, a good old German professor doesn't use PowerPoint, <laughs> which is, not, of course, not true because we all always use PowerPoint. But today, I, I thought it, I don't want to do it. I want to focus on one dimension only. I'm speaking and, and, and you are listening. And I also don't have a printed version. I have a preliminary version in, in German. So all I have is this paper. So. My three points which I want to make, which one of them take a little bit shorter of 20 minutes, is one, critical anthropology as the view from afar. Two, from critical studies to studies of critique. And three, pragmatism and critique. Now the first part of it, critical anthropology as the view from afar, takes, with this part I try to take you back 
deeper in the history of anthropology and some of you might never have heard of it and others will recognize it because they didn't think about that a long time and others might be bored. Uh, so there are many ways of telling the, the history of anthropology and one, one of them, and I'm not saying it's the only one, one of them is reminding that colonization, the colonization of the world also implied decentering Euro-America. So, in other words, more than 20th century anthropology partly was a project of rehabilitation, as I want to call it, of all those who got under the suspicion of being irrational. A rehabilitational anthropology enacted itself as the intellectual program that carries the responsibility to protect people from the global south against the onslaught of modernity. One way of telling the story. Bronislav Malinowski is the usual name this program is uh, attributed to. And in his famous foreword to a book published in 1937 here in New York by Julius Lips, The Savage Hits Back, he found a, a captivating phrase for this intellectual enterprise. He wrote, anthropology is the science of the sense of humor. It can be thus defined without too much pretension or facetiousness. For to see ourselves as others see us is but the reverse and the counterpart of the gift to see others as they really are and as they want to be. And this is the métier of the anthropologist. This program implies and this is not surprising, a number of flaws which have been mentioned and debated over many, many years, several times. These flaws, mainly two were picked out, namely the essentializing dimension of it and the homogenizing uh, dimension of it, essentializing and homogenizing other point of view. Others called this thing Orientalism. There are many other names of othering and so on. I don't focus on, on these accusations. I, I focus on a third one, on another, a third flaw, namely the view from afar, as uh, formulated here by Malinowski, was inconsequential and bracketed the core of modernity. It, on the French side, it was Levi Strauss, who was here, one of our predecessors, who was the other giant who under the notion of regard, Eloigné was uh, doing a similar business, decentering Europe by looking at it from afar. And the, the flaw in this is, has also been uh, debated, I'm not saying anything new, was that it was inconsequential. It could have been taken further, but they stopped short of getting the point. Now, I will elaborate this by repeating and summarizing an old debate that some of you might know because it, at some time it was a famous debate and uh, it's about the, the shade roof in witchcraft, the magic and oracles of Evan Spritcher, the famous shade roof which is loaded with uh, the harvest, the heavy harvest and which is constructed out of wooden poles which are being eaten up by termites regularly and in other words it necessarily from time to time collapses and it sometimes unfortunately collapses when somebody is having a rest in the shadow under this uh, shade roof and sometimes this ends up in death Alan Spritchard and his interlocutors uh, easily and immediately agree upon the reason why the shadow roof is collapsing or has collapsed. It is because the termites have uh, destroyed the wood and maybe a little wind added to it and so it collapsed. But Alan Spritcher's interlocutors are not aware, not satisfied with this explanation. They uh, wanted to go one step further. Why did it collapse exactly in the moment when somebody was below it? It could have collapsed before or after. And why was it this person and not another person? This is not explained by the causal link between the termites, the wind, uh, and, and the collapse. 
And so here we are with witchcraft. This person has been bewitched and then a certain procedure is being started on how to examine which, which, which is, who is the witch and what, what kind of witchcraft was it and, and so on. In order to deal with this ethnographic little uh, issue, he constructs a puzzle. And now this is my argument uh, about this puzzle. Namely, when a person dies in those days among the Adande, which live at the border between the southern Sudan and the Congo, and when a person dies who is suspected of being a witch because there was uh, an accusation against her or him shortly before her death, an autopsy is carried out to search for a particular lump in the guts. If this lump is being found, this is proof that the person was a witch, and the explanation, at least post hoc, was why the other person had to die. At the same time, Zandik conviction has it that this lump, which proves that the person is a witch, is hereditary. And here is the puzzle Evans Bridget constructs. If somebody is proven a witch because a lump was found in the guts, it means, through the logic of uh, 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 the assumption it's uh, hereditary, that everybody who is in the same hereditary line is also a witch. The uh, inheritance goes from father to sons and from mothers to daughters. So if somebody is a witch, his father and all other male kin in this line are also witches, is the Evans Preacher's deduction. His in interlocutors smile at him and say, no, 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 you, you are getting it wrong. This, this is, this is, this is a, a, a wrong uh, conclusion. And so for Evans Pritchard, this is a puzzle which needs explanation because he assumes the logical conclusion would be, yes, sure, that everybody is. So what's the explanation? He eventually works out over several pages. Uh, his interlocutors introduce a second distinction in order to deal with this in, in logical incoherence. They distinguish between hot and cold witches. So you might have a lump in your gut because you inherit it, but you, you are not a witch because the, your lump is cold. The puzzle and its solution have two presuppositions. The first presupposition is that then the logic is a, is a part to the whole, and the whole being universal logic, which is on the side of Evans Pritchard, as the universal logic inherent in, in, this, in the sciences. So if these two contradict each other and it's part of the whole, there is a contradiction we need to deal with. It. That's the first assumption which goes into the ethnographic puzzle. The second assumption is that logic has the capacity to disprove or to destabilize uh, institutions. In short, logic beats institutions. About 30 years after the publication of uh, Abbott Spridgen's book in 1937, 30 years later, in 1964, Peter Winge in philosophy, drawing on Wittgenstein, made a famous case of out of the Zander shade roof. He, by drawing on, on uh, Wittgenstein, he disproves the part the, the first presupposition Evans Pritchard made, namely the part whole. Winch explains the fact that the Zande do not care and do not bother, do not care to bother about the contradiction shows that they are in another language game. In another language game from Western logic. When they talk about witchcraft, they are in a different language game, so they do not need to bother. So both of them, both authors, Peter Winch and Evans Pritchard, are interested in rehabilitation. The one is interested in, in re rehabilitation by explaining how Zande logic is structured by in institution, and the other one is interested in showing how multiple realities can coexist. So th th this, by then, in, in the late 60s, was a famous debate, mostly in philosophy, and less so in anthropology. Another 15 years later, in 1976, David Bloor takes the argument up again. Bloor concentrates on the second presupposition of Evans Pritchard's puzzle, namely to assume that logic can lever out institution. In a piece of ironic and fictive ethnography, Bloor introduces uh, an ethnographer 
coming to Britain and learning that murderer, a murderer is a person who intentionally kills a human being. The ethnographer deduces that bomber pilots in war are murderers. The natives smile at his lack of understanding <laughs> and patiently introduce an additional differentiation, namely the one between war and peace. The conclusion which uh, David Blore draws, uh, and I can summarize it, uh, summarize it, is logic poses no threat to the institution of witchcraft, for one piece of logic can always be met by another one. In Blur's view, the puzzle posed by Evans Pritchard was no puzzle, but the effect of two false presuppositions, the one which Winch did away with and the other one which he himself did away with. At the core of Evans Pritchard's argumentation is the blind spot of his own observation. Evans Pritchard naturally assumes that he, as a scientist, does not have to bother about his own positionality. His job was to examine the positionality of those he describes and to explain their actions by reference to their institutions. That was the state of the art in those days. While he himself stands outside the institution, he is doing this while he himself stands outside the institutional blindness. And therefore, Evan Spritchard's core sentence, which rarely is quoted, goes, which is, as the Azande could see them, clearly do not exist. So re rehabilitation of the, of the kind implied in the following quotation, Zen the belief in no way contradicts empirical knowledge of cause and effect, always goes for a price, a price of denunciation. Enunciating their cap uh, capability to think straight and logically implies that they are on a minor position, uh, on a less reflective position than the author who tries to rehabilitate them. For my argumentation, it is important to note that in as late as 1986, Marx and Fisher, in their volume Anthropology as Cultural Critique, still go into the same old trap when they write. Evans Pritchard boldly took such practices as witchcraft and magic, uh, pay attention to such practices. He only pays attention to witchcraft and magic. And compared them with Western science and common sense on an equal footing. Now the clue made by David Blur is that this footing was heavily unequal. The sentence by Marcus and Fisher sounds strangely naive today, but in fact so it was in 1986 already. Since their edited volume, was all about anthropology to turn to the critique of Western world making. What both volumes, namely uh, Anthropology's Cultural Critique and the Writing Culture volume with uh, uh, James Clifford and, and George Marcus, what, what both authors, uh, volumes and their authors did not attempt or even see, perhaps, I'm not sure, is that one of the citadels of Western culture which they wanted to critique, and I'm not, not sure whether this is the right word, the citadels of Western culture, but I leave it at that, that one of these citadels was technoscience, which they bracketed out, to, as Evans Pritchard. To summarize the genealogy of the bright side of the 20th century anthropology, I like to say anthropology was partly constituted as a rehabilitation program. This program was about the accusation of irrationality and its defense. It made anthropology big and strong. It stopped at the walls of its own presuppositions as social science. And when it turned towards its own uh, positionality, namely in uh, 1986, of course this happened before and so on, but to have a marker, when it turns to its own positionality, it still turned a blind eye towards technoscience. I'm coming now to my second step, namely speaking about critical from critical studies to studies of critique. 
a 13 that under Fuji in the 1980s missed the crucial dimension of its enterprise is not a form of critique. It is just an attempt to construct a certain genealogy. And even more so, asserting that the sociology of scientific knowledge, as it was then called and later become, became known as SNTS, grasp this very same crucial dimension is not a form of laudatio, it was their business. They had other flaws. So this is not of saying who did a better job, this is to construct a genealogy why these two, if you wish, disciplines or intellectual interventions had to merge and they merged. And it is pointless to try to pull them apart or have this sort of marital fiasco every day who is more powerful and who is losing out. This is a merger which comes from the matter. So as I recapitulated in the, in the previous point a few steps in the genealogy of anthropology and critique, I will now re recapitulate a few in the social studies of scientific knowledge or sociology of scientific knowledge, SSK, as it later became known as SDS. This business has emerged as anthropology over a long time. And it has emerged exactly around the issue that anthropology did not deal with and did not have to deal with. Namely, doing science or technoscience is perhaps just another practice that struggles with its own indeterminism, its fallibility, with the fact that the empirical cannot fully be substantiated, cannot fully substantiate the, the theoretical. This intellectual enterprise has certainly many genealogies, again. For my purpose, it is in order to emphasize one possible genealogy. In 1929, Karl Mannheim publishes Ideologie und Utopie. 1929, Ludwig Fleck publishes Zur Krise der Wirklichkeit, on the crisis of reality. In 1935, the same Ludwig Fleck publishes Entstehung und Entwicklung einer wissenschaftlichen Tatsache, Emergence and Development of a Scientific Fact. 1938, Robert K. Merton publishes Science, Technology and Society in 17th Century England. In 1962, Thomas Kuhn publishes The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. In 1979, Bruno Latour and Steve Woolga turn this into laboratory studies and publish Laboratory Life, The Construction of Scientific Facts in a rhetoric as, as if they were the first one to make this observation and by completely ignoring these uh, <laughs> 80 years of their predecessors. In 1985, Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaffer, not ignoring this genealogy, but acknowledging it, published Leviathan and the Ed Palm, Hobbesy Boys and the Experimental Life. And finally, in 1986, John Law is editing a volume called Power, Action, and Belief, which is, so to speak, the parallel publication to the other anthropological publication in 1986 about anthropology as cultural uh, critique. Now, in 86, like the anthropological reinvention of itself, by not drawing many historical links, the, the history of the... the, the of studying the emergence of scientific knowledge and technology was reinvented in this volume. And these were two competing enterprises, and as I said before, they had to merge. As long as anthropology is dealing with critique of Western institutions, it cannot avoid the SNTS debate, and as long as SNTS is drawing on ethnography, it cannot avoid the anthropology, and so on. So concerning critique, the two discourses, namely the one, let me call it cultural critique, and the second one, let me call it the construction of scientific facts, were operating, however, in very different terrains. From Malinowski to Marx and Fisher, the business to bring light on processes that go unobserved behind the backs of people was comparatively comfortable and also safe, epistemologically <coughs> and politically safe. For the scholars, entering the citadels of science, or the lion's cave, practicing critique was an entirely different enterprise. SSK and later SNTS was interrogating a domain where their interlocutors were not only painfully aware of the principal fallibility of their theories and practices, 
the empirical underdeterminedness of their findings. They were also the official experts highly paid for this just because of their competence. As he has had to and wanted to live with the fact that it cannot compete with scientists, uh, that it cannot aim to explain matters of fact, namely the findings of the sciences, by offering social explanation of scientific facts. Evans Pritchard's bold sentence, which is, as he has only conceived them, clearly do not exist, cannot be translated into science studies. When one speaks about molecules or about genes, the sentence is simply nonsense. Uh, this was a favorable situation, however, to sharpen critique. Critique is not contradicting a pos position with another one, seemingly better one, or, and, and both on the same level. Critique rather means to scrutinize the frame of reference in which a controversy goes on. For instance, Simon and Schaffer do not argue about the physics of boils. They argue about the emergence of a new regime of evidence, matters of fact. And that, that included both sides, the politics and the science. However, in the long run, SNTS could not hide the fact that it diagonally opposes and undermines the official self-representation of the sciences. And I emphasize that they do not undermine the business of sciences, but the official self-representation of the sciences, which is something completely else and becomes important later in my argumentation. In the 90s, this uh, matter uh, resulted in what uh, became known as the science wars. People defending the official rhetorics of the sciences, uh, and not the sciences, their official references, attacked anybody arguing along the post-foundational paradigm for dismantling the most cherished intellectual good democracy has, namely to settle controversies by recourse to matters of fact or by recourse to truth that can be proved by agreed upon procedures. In 2004, Bruno Latour reacted to this derailed controversy with the article, Why has critique run out of steam from matters of fact to matters of concern? The disturbing observation he starts from is this. While global warming in those years, in the 90s, and, or no, in 2003, had been established as a matter of fact, the controversy was by and large closed. A Republican strategist, Mr. Luntz, was quoted in the New York Times in, 2000, in May 2003 by, by saying, and now I'm not quoting the New York Times, but I'm saying what Bruno Latour quotes out of the New York Times. Most scientists believe that global warming is caused largely by man-made pollutants that requires strict regulation. Mr. Luntz, a Republican strategist, seems to acknowledge as much when he <coughs> says that the scientific debate is closing against us. His advice, however, is to emphasize that evidence is not complete. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, he writes, and is quoted in the New York Times, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the See why I'm worried? <laughs> For me, the answer is yes and no. For the yes. In, <coughs> in, in a country where democracy and the rule of law are fairly well established, like in the USA, one normally expects political representatives to play by the rules of the game <coughs> and respect scientific expertise. I mean, to expect if something is established as a truth to the procedures which the sciences have agreed upon, that political representatives are another ones who should temper with them. For instance, global warming was established as a matter of fact. So, if that happens, if 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 somebody like Mr. Luns violates these rules of the game, this is 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 a matter of of. The legal system is a matter of law, of violating the law, of violating the, the rules of the game, and it's a matter of political culture. It is less a, a matter of a scientific controversy. And yes, in that sense, I see why Bruno Latour is worried, but maybe for the wrong reason. And therefore, I move on to the, uh, the next step, maybe why I don't see why he needs to be worried. 
From its inception, modern science emerged as a practice to generate evidence for regularities about regularities in the world by means and procedures where, that were open by definition for impeachment. Recognizing its own fallibility marks the distinction between modern science and other forms of knowing. Therefore, the question <coughs> as to whether controversy has been closed or still goes on is or, or when it can be reopened, cannot be answered once and forever. And this is even more the case if one follows Latour approvingly, when matters of fact need at the same time to be matters of concern, as he, as he argues, in order uh, to exist and to endure and to stay stable. So, if this is also true, then even more so the question is when a controversy is closed, will forever remain uh, controversial. So this delicate arrangement uh, cannot be defended by reference to an object, see the global warming, as the memory of the Shoah cannot be once and forever be closed by saying, look at the Shoah. This is a business which has to be repeated every year, every day, by every generation. And it, need, it needs the whole apparatus of evidence production because we don't have, we don't get reality twice. Once to construct it and then to, to point to the result of it because that's the vicious circle to which Bruno Latour himself draws attention. So Mr. Lunds is not actually an exception to the rule which Bruno Latour himself established. There is always, there are always innumerable other cases working along similar lines. And that, in fact, is the, the long-term, as I said, uh, Latour's long-term project. But in this article, he tries to mark a seizure as if something had happened uh, in the year he was writing it, or in the few years before he was writing it. He uses the event of, of the science world to elaborate on critique and to repeat with some clarifications what he said before. Namely, <clears throat> sort of bullet points. There is no social explanation of scientific facts. Okay, we got it. The critique that goes this way misses the point. We got it. <laughs> so the point lies in the way matters of fact come to count, which cannot be deduced from themselves. Okay. This happens when they become linked to matters of concern. So the latter, the matters of concern, do not explain the matters of fact. They just are hooked up to them. They stabilize them. And that actually was the move within actor networks theory uh, by introducing the notion of actons or quasi-hybrid uh, 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 actors, non-humans, who are being attributed agency of their own. This is the move in order to avoid uh, articulating critique against the sciences by saying, yes, you're right, you discover the right rules and there are these entities, but however, they have their own agency. And this is all I'm talking about. So in this paper, he's drawing on a different vocabulary. He's uh, using Heideggerian vocabulary, speaking about the gathering, the Versammlung. Heideggerian Versammlung is uh, bringing human and non-human things together and assembling them into a Gestell, into an uh, apparatus, as, as uh, others would say. So what Heidegger has in mind with Versammlung or the gathering is bringing matters of fact and matters of concern together as uh, Latour uses the same uh, terminology. Now I, I quote uh, from this paper of Latour, whatever the words, however, in whatever the words we want to call this, what is presented here is an entirely different attitude than the critical one. It is not a flight into the conditions of possibility of a given matter of fact, not the addition of something more human that the inhumane matters of fact would have missed, but rather a multifarious inquiry launched with the tools of anthropology, philosophy, metaphysics, history, sociology, to detect how many participants are gathered in a thing, 
to make it exist and to maintain its existence. Objects are simply objects as Gegenstand. Uh, objects are simply a gathering that has failed, a fact that has not been assembled according to due process. Now, I want to analyze this, this, this statement with which I disagree. A thing is a matter of fact that is at the same time a matter of concern, yes. An object, namely a Gegenstand in, in the sense of Martin Heidegger, is just a matter of fact which opposes human action. Now, critique in this critical reading of Latour is classified as the flight, the flight which the critic moves into, the, the, the flight in a direction which Bruno Latour, Latour asserts to be a dead end. The direction being the scrutiny of the conditions of the possibility of technoscientific practices. This is classified as a dead end. Why? The, the kind of critique Bruno Latour wants us to favor instead, which we then can call post criticism is the one which offers the participants arenas or fora in which to gather the right things. Because if you know that if something, and it is a quote, if something is constructive, then it means it is fragile and thus in great need of care and caution. With this argument, a debate about post-criticism gained a new momentum and is being picked up by, by several people. Instead of critically speaking of a derailed project, project of critique, Bruno Latour, I assert, could have uh, spoken about a new step in the critique of technosciences. He doesn't want to be put in genealogies. He wants to start new genealogies. So he could not have said this is a new way of reformulating what Foucault has been saying all the time and so on. He, he needs to start a new genealogy. This move, however, perfectly well corresponds to what Michel Foucault argued about the possibility of post-foundational critique in May 1978, where perhaps Latour was uh, listening. What Bruno Latour debunks, debunks as critique in this paper is in fact not critique in the sense of Michel Foucault. Bruno Latour speaks of positions which disagree about the question whether something is grounded in nature or reality and is there for effect, and other positions uh, uh, where the, the opposite is assumed, namely that facts are grounded in something human or social. And he blames it on Kant, unfortunately. In, in Foucault's understanding critique, the, the, the kind of critique that uh, Bruno Latour does is exactly, however, the critique he had in mind. He sh namely, what does Latour do? He shifts the, the controversy to a different level. And he shows that it is something else when framed differently. Namely, he frames it as assemblage, as, uh, as, uh, as, as versammlung, as gathering, and, and thereby says it is not about the scientists are right or those who, uh, we, which he blames on Kant for the assumption that it is the, the human mind which frames this thing. He says, no, it is a gathering of both of them. So this is, in, in my reading, exactly what Foucault <coughs> had in mind when he defined what critique is. So, however, I, I can live with both terms. I, I don't mind if we call this critique or if we want to follow Bruno Latour and call this post-criticism. And, and some of my work has been classified as post-critical uh, in, in the journal Common Knowledge. However, what I cannot live with is Bruno Latour's evasion of the burning question raised by Michel Foucault in Drawing from Nietzsche. How is the post-critical post critic, like Bruno Latour, how can he, sorry, how is the post-critical critic enunciated by Latour, the, the one he wants to be? How, how, how can this person know which arenas, which gatherings to prepare, to support, to be cautious, to be cautious about and to care for? How do we know? 
and this is related to the design question, if, if this uh, gatherings need to be shaped, in other words, need to be designed, how do we know which one to shape with caution and which one to avoid? Tunaratu is evading this question. Foucault speaks of risk-taking, risk-taking at this point, at the limits of the epistemological field. He speaks of virtue, he speaks of courage, he speaks of risking the subject at the limits of its orderings. This Foucauldian argument has been beautifully summarized by Judith Butler, where it, I guess, becomes clearer than it is in Foucault. So Foucault goes to great pains to make this point, and Judith Butler, uh, so to speak, helped him work it out post-mortem. <laughs> if the critic has no better foundation, is the point, than the position criticized, then we are simply in a foundational circle and we will have to live with this foundational circle. While Bruno Latour bypasses this issue, in my reading this is a form of bypassing it, Michel Foucault becomes, however, trapped in another argument. I mean, the argument that assumes that critique is primarily about the subject and her free will, surrounded by coherent ordering related to the uh, to, to power. He is obsessed by the issue of how the subject gains critical distance, on uh, critical distance to established authority. Now this obsession is not necessary. For, for both shortcomings, uh, namely the one by Latour who evades the main problem. How do we know which arenas to support and which to avoid? And the other short and, and the other uh, shortcoming, namely Foucault's shortcoming, to assume this is a matter of, indivi of, of the individual creating critical distance. There are interesting answers in in pragmatism, and I come to my third and last part of it. It's a two that force, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, instead of focusing, like Foucault, on how authority and regimes of truth are being made tighter and tighter in the particular figuration of knowledge, power, and subject formation in what's being called uh, biopower, the new French pragmatist sociology of critique around Luc Boltanski and Laurent Thévenot focus on the contradictions between different modes of justifications, which don't get tighter, but more and more contradictory, in fact. Critique, in this view, does not appear as this amazing aporia about a foundational circle. Critique is no longer this mysterious trick on how to substantiate an argument as the better one if one lacks the foundation for this uh, move. Critique in pragmatist uh, view is rather this modest and very famil familiar move born out of the necessity to act, to keep on going, to be held accountable, to give justifications in situations that do not relate to one and the same truth regime. The sociology of critique distinguishes modes of justification, like for instance, and, and this can vary from case to case, but for uh, uh, the, the current situation in France, they say it, it could be six, like a mode of justification which refers to the domestic sphere, one to the civic sphere, one to the market, another one to the industry, one to the question of what inspiration means, and the other one to the level of, of, of opinion. And they distinguish between different modes of valuation, modes of information, of social relation, and of qualification. Now, most situations and sites or acts relevant for the question of critique are characterized by being referred to contradicting to several and contradicting claims or set of rules that claim to order that action. Or the other way around, whenever you have an action or a decision, it is is can be justified by a number of these modes of justification which each of them contradict each other. And these contradictions create an intellectual space where no action can be justified satisfactorily 
with reference to all modes of justification, always only to some or maybe even one of them. Some of the modes of justification will be confirmed by action, and others will, by necessity, be disconfirmed, rejected, and sometimes uh, directly critiqued. Critique, then, in the sociology of critique or in this pragmatist view, is an aspect of institutions, of mundane, everyday practices. Other than Foucault, who starts from power, pragmatist sociology or anthropology starts from uncertainty that can be processed but not overcome. Institutions are the process or the, the props or the crutches to live with uncertainty. Hence, institutions lack a stable foundation and exist as long as they are confirmed in practice. The need for this confirmation for the institutions to appear valid and valuable implies the possibility of disconfirmation. This is simply because a confirmation that does not imply the option of disconfirmation is not a confirmation. The issue to be dealt with uh, would be shifted if it, if it wouldn't need the confirmation, it would be shifted to the realm of certainty where no institutional props uh, are being needed anyway. So in this perspective, critique is nothing that needs steam or can run out of steam. The question simply doesn't make sense. Uh, it, critique is a necessity. It is just there as, other, as, as the other side of confirmation. It, it cannot be avoided. To come back to David Bloor's argument that logic cannot be institution. With Boltanski, we must say that institution depends on confirmation that presupposes the capacity to resist, to be critical, to be logical. So the, the, the contradiction, one beating the other, is getting it wrong because one enables the other one and vice versa. To come back to Bruno Latour's call, addressing the, the critic to stop debunking and rather move on to contribute to the shaping or designing of the right arenas or fora to assemble the right associations in the sense of uh, gathering, for example. With Boltanski, we must say that confirming the right association implies the possibility of their critique. Otherwise, it wouldn't be confirmed. The move pro proposed by Bruno Latour is no move in the perspective uh, elaborated by, uh, by Botansky. And of course, they don't talk on this level to each other because they are friends, but somebody must uh, speak it out, and, and here I have done so. And then the final question remains, however. How do we know which institutions, which gatherings to care for and, and which to avoid? I can see nothing reassuring or desirable in hoping that the non-humans and the distributed agency of hybrid networks will help us to design or to construct the better associations. It may not be necessary here, but maybe I can bear to say it. Uh, Heidegger joined the NSDAP in 1933 and in 1949 after the war, the French court uh, decided that this is a case of Mittelläufer, uh, so he would not face punishment, but he was uh, not re-established as a as chair of philosophy in, in Heidelberg ever again. And in an interview in the 60s, he said this this was his great, the, the greatest betise of his, oh, I don't know how to say that in English, Dummheit, <laughs> stupidity in his, his life. That's one way of putting it. Another way of putting it is that he joined the, the wrong gathering. <laughs> Assuming that gatherings have this affordance character, you just need to join them. I'm sorry, but I, I think this harsh note needs to be mentioned also. So, in, in other words, we humans still have to try to get it right, and Bruno Latour would not write this text about the critique running out of theme just for us humans, where he really to assume that the non-humans would be part of the job to design, to design the associations. And he also would not have reason to be worried about Mr. Luntz and the Republicans because they anyway would just have to join the right associations and they are just about to choose.
the association of their life. So hope and the conditions of uncertainty should then, I assume, be more directed towards something else, namely towards getting political emancipation right when there is no foundation for it, rather than waiting for the gathering to call. Now, Boltansky also has a post-critical project. In other words, the answer is also not in Boltansky. Boltansky suggests in a labored attempt to distance himself from Bourdieu, namely, to, he, he suggests to shift the attention to the critical process going on, critical process going on in society rather than offering a sociological critique from above that unveils something that the critics he studies don't see. While this is certainly an important shift, it remains rather helpless, I believe, in the face of, for instance, right-wing racist movements in France, which in their self-perceptions are critical movements. So the Boltansky program of post-criticism means we must stop, by all means, doing what uh, Bourdieu did, namely to offer a critique from the chair and show people what's going on behind their backs, is to join critical movements. Now, uh, Boltansky will not join the right-wing movement. Why not? Uh, why not? There must be a, a reason for that, which is not accounted for. So hoping to get out of the aporia by standing behind uh, the practices of critical movements falls a bit short. There is no way out of the aporia, and that's where Foucault speaks of virt virtue or courage or risking the individual at the border uh, of, of, of knowledge, others speak of, of, of hope. For instance, Hiro Miyazaki or Helen Veran. Now, I assert that the pulling apart of critique and post criticism is misconceived. In both cases, it is about the sources of hope to care for the right gathering, to care for the right Versammlung uh, of human and non humans when indeterminacy and uncertainty are here to stay with us. And uh, Jeff had to leave for a meeting. He, was, he said he was in need of hope. Uh, but, but this is all I have to say about hope. And I thank you very, very much for uh, enduring this to the force of your mind. this inspiring talk and I was a bit surprised how you introduced Boltansky as a solution for this problem of the foundation of critique because as you pointed out yourself in the end he doesn't really offer um, an approach of this foundational moment of the critical scientist um, because he reduces the project against the old paternalistic ideology critique to just follow the people who are already criticizing, but isn't giving any foundation why, why they should do so. So he cannot say what is good critique, what is bad critique. Um, and so if you could just say a bit more why you juxtaposed him and uh, Latour, who are equally silent on this question of foundation. And um, the framing of that question or the background is uh, Robin Selicatis. I'm sure you know his book on exactly that question. He um, is talking about ideology critique, Bourdieu versus Boltansky, and exactly with the problem you have, the problem of the foundation of critique. And then he goes to the good old German Frankfurt School, um, Habermas and Honneth, where people are working on the model of imminent critique which is exactly there for tackling this problem, to be not paternalistic and to still have something meaningful to say, which is not just following your actors. So what would you say about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I agree with what you said about Botansky, and I introduced him to argue against the assumption that the very fact of being critical is something mysterious, something which we can't really locate, 
because I think that's an extremely important point that uh, confirming that institutions are about uncertainty and in order to continue they have to be repeated in other words confirmed and this confirmation depends on the potentiality of disconfirming them in other words of being critical I think that for that reason I, I needed to uh, introduce uh, Boltanski. But then indeed, uh, as you said, and as I also tried to say, it's like in nature, it's a post-critical position which is evading the question of which critique is the good and which critique is the, uh, the, the right one. And I uh, agree that the next step, so to speak, the, the next talk one could give, which I avoided here to mention is to sort of develop the dialogue between Axel Honneth and Luc Boltanski, and there are also funny passages about that. But I, I, wanted, I needed to focus on something, and to be honest, I also wanted to avoid this in this house, because I know Axel Honneth has been here, uh, is a guest who comes every now and again, and Nancy Fraser might be in the room or not, and I, I, I didn't want to deal with this, and also I didn't want to come with a German solution to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, I'm, I'm not doing an email, by the way. I'm writing down my name. So just a minute. Uh, Jack and, and, you know, I have uh, several, several issues I want to address. Uh, the first is the grab uh, it seems to me that regardless of what form of critique it is, whether it's Kant or Marx or Foucault, that the grammar of it is always critiquing the name of what. Whatever you're analyzing, however you're analyzing it for, you're for something. And it seems to be perfectly proper to ask the next question. Why are you for it? So it seems to me that anybody who's going to use any concept of critique, if he doesn't come clean on that, is evading the issue. So it's, and it's not clear to me. And that this has nothing to do with foundations, but it has to do with the clarification of, you know, what it is we are talking about democracy or more equality or getting rid of injection. You're, you're doing that's the first point. The second is it struck me that the way you left it at the end, that, um, it's completely reversible. It's always who wins out, the right, right gathering. Let's go back to the climate issue. You know, the hell with all this business of what the scientists do and talk about. We're going to convince the people that it's a myth, and we may win in the end of it. That's critique. The Tea Party is engaged in critique, right wing green. green. So what determines what group you're going to join? In this. Now, it struck me, the third point, is that it was almost a giveaway, but it's not a giveaway. Because you said, oh, the minimal thing is it's got to be disconfirmed. Uh, now, that is either apparently to some notion of disconfirmation, which we can all accept, or raising the whole issue, what counts as disconfirmation? From a Tea Party point for you, would you consider confirmation or from a person's anti-climate, it's, it's not a confirmation. So it strikes me that there's a logic of which you, where, where you end up that it's so empty that you can critique something from any point of view and there's no way of, or it's not clear, how you sort of evaluate the different kinds of critiques. Thank you. Um, that's a difficult one. I, on a simple level, I agree, especially because I ended on this terms that I said at the end, the distinction what to critique and what not to critique, what, or rather what to, to, to care for, and which fora to stabilize in order to achieve what seems good to achieve is a political decision. It is a decision which cannot be founded in, in anything uh, unshakable. Uh, if, if that is the case, then critique yet yeah, must be linked to some uh, political aim. Uh, but it is, it is also a political aim 
namely to institutionalize a form of uh, democracy, a form of politics, which is about the art to avoid decisions which can't be undone. Uh, in, in other words, any decision which which comes which comes along as being based in an eternal, unshakable truth is suspicious in this perspective. And a, a, a critical stance which avoids disclosure and wants to say, let us only decide on such <coughs> things which we can undo again because we might be wrong is in itself a political uh, goal. And, and then the position is, is thin, yes, because it is about calling for more caution, about calling for more care, about calling for more reflexivity, and it's hard to, to build alliances on, on, on those terms. And it is impossible to, to build alliances when you say, I, I'm not sure whether I'm right, but, let, but follow me. Mm. Uh, but that is also the distinction between a contraposition and critique. So. Uh, it, the Tea Party in its self-perception is, is critical, but in, in the terms which I okay, uh, in, the, in the analytical concept of critique, as I offer it here, in, in, if you wish, in the tradition of Foucault, it is not a form of critique, it's a form of, of opposition. And critique would be I exactly on bringing that controversy on a different level and, and, and then see how it, it operates. And uh, I know these answers are not uh, to your satisfaction, but I, I can't give a better one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on uh, Dick's question, because it strikes me that in uh, your talk, you never used the words of moral judgment, right or wrong, good or bad. And you were rather dismissive, I think, when you spoke about Foucault's uh, lecture, What is Critique? delivered in 1978, where it's true, he says basically that critique uh, has as its aim freedom, uh, autonomy, independence, and he reasserts the legacy of Kant and the Enlightenment, which shocked all of his auditors who were expecting the normal Foucauldian uh, uh, talk about structure. And it seems to me that the whole end of Foucault's life is a uh, backtracking into uh, an attempt to come to grips with moral thinking. And it seems that to me, as a, an outsider, although I've read some of what you are referring to, it's as though you have put together a talk that's all about um, theories about the social production of theories, about the social productions of theories. It's like an M.C. Escher uh, 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 serpent chasing its own tail and the actual content of what would be necessary to have a reasonable answer to why should I join this assembly and oppose this would require some reference to moral judgment. Uh, and it may be that you don't think such judgment is possible or available. Uh, but the science bit of this struck me as a, um, it, it's not the place that you should be looking if you want to be able to answer the question. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a, a sharp caricature of, of what I wanted to say. Uh, actually, uh, when my argument about, in the last resort, a post-foundational uh, engagement with this gathering or with that gathering is, is, is political, I could uh, have gone on and uh, spoken about the ethical and moral dimension of it. And I didn't, uh, it was not my intention to be dismissive of Foucault's uh, argument, uh, quite to the contrary. I, I thought I, I put it center stage and I defended it up to the end. It is just that I thought his obsession with subject formation and posing power and the subject against each other and uh, uh, it, it produces a form of sort of uh, homogenization of, of authority or of, of, of truth reg regimes, which is simply empirically not, not correct. And when I then shifted to 
uh, Bortansky with the different modes of justification, that is actually the sociological uh, contribution uh, of our times, which brings the moral dimension back into the, the social sciences. And since that was my approach as a sort of a, the, the, the new French pragmatism, since that was my final statement, my statement is also about reintroducing m morality. So, uh, in fact, I fully agree, and I'm, I'm sorry if that didn't become clear. Maybe I, I was too short at the end when, when dealing with Boltanski. But Boltanski's project is exactly about that, namely in, in the offerings of several different modes of justification, it needs a judgment. And ju this judgment is, is, uh, is, is a moral judgment. Uh, there's a job that positionality does in the first third that gives you a sort of reciprocal leverage between uh, modernity and its other, but it seems to disappear by the third story. And we only have one kind of positionality that's got to do with the colonial story. But surely what's relevant to the third story is that all these people share the same class. I mean, setting aside Bruno's inheritance, we're talking about a certain class. Uh, and, you know, is not the lack of leverage to do with the fact that you don't address positionality at all by the time we get to the first, fifth or last third. Yes. I, I would think that this is uh, a, a problem in the construction of my argument because I, I, I didn't sort of fully uh, come in a circle back to the first point. Anthropology and critique is, is also about the good old problem of <coughs> universalization, for instance, of, of human rights. And, and this is where the, the argument uh, closes and comes back. On, on, on the one hand, uh, and this is where Boltanski comes to a help, on, on the one hand, we all know that there is no foundation for universal human rights, and at the same time, most of us want them to be there in some version. And the question is, in what version? And, and, and <coughs> situating so-called culturalist arguments, yeah, we have our version of Asian human rights and we have our sort of Islamic human rights, is a debate of which you don't easily come out with a hardcore position, but with an anthropology of critique, which starts from the skeptics within the system and then finds out what is their skepticism about. There is a way of facilitating a, to stick in this language, a gathering, a, a fora, a forum, where a communication is possible without uh, an octroi of what you mean by human rights and what I mean by human rights. We still can co communicate by leaving that void open, assuming we, we want to move in that direction. And, and, and that is where it becomes practical and, and political for, for anthropology. I'll ask the last question then before we... I, I wanted to know exactly, I suppose on a scale of one to ten, how much irony you meant <laughs> by the notion of a matter of fact. Well, in the history of science, much has been uh, written about the attempt to to come to so to speak to, to agree on procedures on, 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 on what to consider as the as the, the matter which counts and and here the, this notion matter of fact has, has entered and and of course the assumption is that this is an agreement of among those who need to agree, and uh, it's fragile and it, it, it can be reopened, and, and this is the point why, it, it, a, in order to be stable, they need to be linked to matters of concern to, to sort of continue and, and, and be stabilized. And uh, in that sense, no, there was an, the, the irony which is in the title of my book, Far Fetched Facts, and this expression. <laughs> Matters of fact, it, it, it doesn't travel because this is, so to speak, a, a formulation from basically uh, Stephen Sh uh, Shapley and Simon Sharp. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thank you very much.